Well, it's good to see everybody again. And uh, those that couldn't make it today, some on vacation and stuff, that's, uh, I know they're enjoying themselves. So uh, I want to tell you about my day yesterday. Uh, I just had one of them great days yesterday. And uh, you don't get those too often at our age, you know. <laughs> but, but it was a great day. Uh, I got to ride my motorcycle about 300 miles and ain't got to do that for a while. I got to visit some small towns that I uh, grew up in as a kid. And uh, I ended up my day, uh, rode through a small town and a guy was sitting out in his yard, and he was my best friend in fourth grade. And so we sat and talked with me and him and his brother for about uh, two hours, you know. And Pat was 360-ing me, 360 in me on her phone, like, where's he at? So, but my day started out, I got to share the gospel with 100 people, and I got 100 people to say the sinner's prayer. So that's pretty good, right? So, and so how did I do it? <laughs> it was a dream. What? It was a dream. No, it wasn't a dream. <laughs> yeah, she kind of knows me. <laughs> uh, it's a joke, right? <laughs> no, uh, it was a funeral. I had, remember the guy that I told you, my cousin that uh, had cancer real bad? Well, he passed away about. Uh, about three weeks ago, and so, you know, they had him uh, uh, cremated. cremated. There you go. It's like, yeah, so he was cremated, but they had his funeral yesterday, and it's actually his birthday because I thought, why on earth would somebody mess up the weekend having a funeral on a, you know, holiday weekend? But uh, I understood after later it was his birthday too. So it was actually a celebration of life because – I think I told you guys that I got to lead him to the Lord because he called me telling me he had only like a month to live. And I think he lived like six weeks after I talked to him. So I got to lead him to the Lord. And so after I went and visited him at his house before he passed away, uh, he had a good day that day. And uh, we always had something in common. He rode motorcycles like I did. And, and that was our kind of reconnection, you know. He was like uh, five years younger than me. And so we were cousins, but he was still, you know, we didn't have a lot in common. So we had reconnected through riding motorcycles. And so there I am visiting him at his house, and he goes, I want you to speak at my funeral. And so, you know, okay. And so he had a pastor friend, and he goes, my pastor friend's going to speak at my funeral too. So I, I talked to his pastor friend, and uh, he goes, well, he goes, I had shoulder surgery, and he goes, me and Johnny, we were real close, and he goes, so I want you to do the service, and I'm just going to do the obituary. So so he did the obituary, and I did the service, and so I got to preach to 100 people yesterday. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and then, you know, well, how did you uh, get him to say the sinner's prayer? Well, we're at a funeral, you know, and so I thought, well, I know, I did this at my brother's funeral too. I got up and talked at my brother's funeral. And I thought, you know, this is the time that people think about death and dying, you know. So uh, at the end, I just, uh, I said, if you guys would all stand, I'd like to lead you into a prayer that Johnny prayed and uh, explain to him how that he was saved, you know. And uh, so everybody stood up and we all said the prayer together. And so that's how. I got a hundred people to say the sinner's prayer, but uh, and you know, if uh, if just one person got saved and they really meant it, then that's great. God can use that, and so you know, uh, and so I just felt good about it. But that was uh, just a good high day for me. As I rode home, a hundred miles yesterday, about seven thirty. That's just so cool and nice, and come up 69 so you could cruise at 80 oh speed limits uh, 75 but anyway <laughs> but you know it's just a great day and uh, so you just don't get them kind of days very often so just wanted to share that with you so all right let's pray 
Father, just uh, thank you for today. I just pray that as Andy speaks to us, Lord, that you'll just give him renewed energy, Lord, and just fill him with your Holy Spirit to speak to us. Pray for those that are gone, uh, Tim and Pam on their vacation honeymoon, Lord. I just pray that you'll help them have a great time and bring them back safely. I just pray for uh, all the others, Lord, that have things to do this uh, holiday weekend, Lord, and are gone, uh, Dave and uh, Connie, I just pray that you'll bring them back safely from Colorado. And uh, all those that couldn't make it today, if any of them sick, just heal their bodies, Lord, and, uh, and bring them back to us. And just bless our, our service here. And just bless our church, Lord. Just uh, help us to grow according to your will with the people that you want to bring to us. And I ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Well, last week we started into the book of Ruth, and so we're going to pick up there into chapter 2 today, but as, as I was reading this and going through it, one of the things that makes me so nervous um, for especially the younger generation, like my kids and, and other Christian young people, is, is them finding the right person to marry. You know, a good if you marry the right person, life could be heaven on earth, right? But if you marry the wrong person, it can be hell on earth too, right? <laughs> Don't, no witnesses. <laughs> Don't point, Ernesto. <laughs> yeah, whoop, there, there's the hell on earth. No. <laughs> but I worry about my kids and I worry about a lot of the younger kids. And, then find, and I was thinking, how in the world is a Christian young person today supposed to find or, or get together with another Christian young person in, in the culture that we live in. Because the culture we live in, I mean, it's the culture's view on marriage is changing every day, it seems like, and it gets further and further away from what the Bible says every day, right? It seems like every day we see something different. I mean, over the last 50 years, marriage in the U.S. has dropped by 60%. That means that, that a lot more people are living together instead of getting married. It's just relationships are temporary. 63% of men under the age of 30 choose to be single. 77% of millennials prefer to live with their partner before marriage. Their mentality is it's like buying a car. You would never buy a car without test driving it, right? And they look at marriage the same way as something like buying a car. Marriage today, just it's something that our culture doesn't seem to value. If you look around, you know, when I was growing up, it wasn't unusual to see people celebrating 50th anniversary, 60th anniversary even, and all of those things. But we don't see those as often anymore, do we? Uh, it just seems like it's not important, especially when over half of marriages end in divorce. So that's not just statistics that's outside of the church. That's statistics that are inside of the church as well. It's, it's, it's everywhere. It's something's not working. It just seems like we're stuck in this horrible cycle. And that's kind of what the definition of insanity is, right? You know, doing the same thing over and over and hoping for a different result. And it seems like people are doing that in our, in our marriages. And I wrote this down because I thought this was a great statement. It says, if you do what most people do, you'll get what most people get. Isn't that deep? <laughs> so if we want something that's different, we've got to do something that is different. That one confused you, didn't it? <laughs> If we do what most people do, we'll get what most people get. So we got to reevaluate things in our world and in our churches as to what's working and what's not. So I want us to think about that in light of what we're going to read in Ruth today. We're in Ruth chapter 2, so we're going to review for a minute. Remember in Ruth chapter 1, we had a family of four living in Bethlehem, and then dad decides because of the the uh, drought that's coming, this famine that's there, he's going to move his family to Moab. They were leaving Bethlehem where they should have been and headed to Moab. And Moab was full of people who were not good people. These were the people that God forbid the nation of Israel to marry. They were started by an incestuous relationship between Lot and his oldest daughter. These people worshipped the demon god, Chemoth, which was the god of the demon god of war. And God actually called Moab his wash pot. God says that Moab, these people, this, this area, is, they're like his dirty dishwater, his trash water. They weren't good people. 
but they moved anyways. This man and his family moved anyways because things looked better there. And while they're there, we know the story. Dad and both sons die. Naomi, the, the mom, is completely heartbroken. So she decides after some time passes that she's going to go back to Bethlehem. She's going to leave Moab, where she shouldn't have been in the first place, and go home to Bethlehem. And she sits her daughters-in-law down, the two daughters that had married her two sons who had passed away, and says, listen, go back to your families. Have, you know, go marry somebody else, have kids. One of them decides to go, and the other one decides that she's going to stay with Naomi. And she says one of the most beautiful things in the Bible in, in Ruth 1, 16, it says, but Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. So what a beautiful statement uh, and commitment that Ruth was making. So these two heartbroken, homeless, helpless, hurting, broke widows return to Bethlehem. And that's how chapter 1 ends. And now it's time for a new chapter. That's because that's that's kind of a depressing chapter. You know, you move, everybody dies, you go home, the end. Not a great story. <laughs> so chapter two kind of turns things around a little bit. And it's, it's beautiful because we have this other chapter, this horrible chapter that closes in her life. And we have a new chapter that's beginning. Have you ever felt like that in your life that there's a chapter that you're just glad it's over? and you're moving to a new chapter in your life, and things are going to be better now. That's kind of what they were, they were feeling. So one of the things that, big things that we saw last week was that we have to leave Moab to find the blessings in Bethlehem. We've got to leave where we're not supposed to be and get where we're supposed to be. So we've got to leave the things, leave Moab behind to get the blessings that God has for us in Bethlehem. So let's pick up in chapter 2, verse 1. Now there was a wealthy and influential man in Bethlehem, named Boaz, who was a relative of Naomi's husband, Elimelech. Now the story begins to turn. Now, you know, I remember I told you last week that this was kind of, in the Bible, it's kind of like stories, that, that different movies, and this one's more like a chick flick. Now enters the handsome, dashing, you know, surgeon or doctor or whatever that, that you would see in the movie. He, he steps in. So Boaz, his name means strength and swiftness. It means that he was a man of strong standing. In Hebrew, the name literally meant that he was a man of wealth, literally a man of property. So this was a man of internal strength and wealth. He was a man of character who was wealthy as well. Story starting to shape up. We got a good-looking rich dude who's got character coming into the story. So things are looking up. And that, you know, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking, man, that's the kind of guy I want my daughters to marry. That's the kind of guy I want to be around. I don't want to marry some weak, complacent, lazy, broke, no character, you fill in the blank. <laughs> That's every dad's dream, right? For your daughter to marry a guy like that? Yeah. And I pray every day they find a guy like Boaz, maybe with a different name. Boaz, I don't know if I could call that. That's a oh, Bo? Bo? I like it. Bo and Luke. <laughs> yeah. So then let's go on Ruth 2, verses 2 and 3. One day Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go out into the harvest fields to pick up the stalks of grain left behind by anyone who is kind enough to let me do it. Naomi replied, All right, my daughter, go ahead. So Ruth went out to gather grain behind the harvesters. The practice of going out in the field and picking up the leftovers from the harvesters is something that God set up for the poor all the way back in Leviticus 19. It's something that was set up so that the poor and the needy would be able to provide. They'd be able to have food. They'd be able to, to survive. So when they would leave this stuff, and that, that really described Naomi and Ruth. They were broke. They were poor. They were in a bad place. Verse 3 goes on and says, So Ruth went out to gather grain behind the harvesters, and as it happened, I love that phrase, it just so happened that she found herself working in the field that belonged to Boaz, the relative of her father-in-law, Elimelech. It just so happened. Just by happenstance, just by chance, that chance meeting in the coffee shop between the two starstruck lovers, or, you know, the, the, this, this chick flick's really taken off. So, um, <laughs> 
like I said, we don't see a lot of miracles in the book of Ruth. There's no chariot races. There's no fire from heaven. There's no raising people from the dead. No miracles like that. But what we do see is the supernatural providence of God. And that's what we're going to see. God's leading them both the whole way. I told you, it's kind of like a romantic comedy, this, this book is. So this poor girl accidentally stumbles into just the right field where we find the dashing, rich, handsome hero. And there's a great principle with that even. with that. Why do you think Ruth met Boaz? You can answer that. That's just a question. What do you think? Why do you think she met him? I mean, was it just chance? I mean, was, it, was there some reason? Well, knowing the woman, she probably planned it. <laughs> she could have. <laughs> yeah. I really believe it's because of what happened in the, the prior chapter. Ruth chapter 1. It says, this is the, the prior chapter, But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's homes, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Naomi was praying for Ruth. <coughs> Her mother-in-law was praying for her. And if we want our kids and grandkids to meet the right person, have the right kind of marriage as a blessed marriage, then we, we should be praying for them as well, shouldn't we? Absolutely. And I'm thankful we have a God who hears and answers our prayers. Verse 4, Ruth 2, back to our story. While she was there, Boaz arrived. The rich, handsome guy shows up from Bethlehem and greets the harvesters. The Lord be with you. He said, the Lord bless you, the harvesters replied. So, Boaz was a good and godly man. First thing he mentions, first time he says something in our story, he's talking about the Lord. He said, the Lord be with you. He, he's basically praying for his employees, the people that are working for him. He blesses them. That's a pretty good boss. That's a pretty good leader who prays for the people who follow him. You know, Boaz wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't any kind of a spiritual you know, leader as far as his employment. He was a businessman. He's a layman. And we need good, godly businessmen and lay people as well. It's not everybody can be a pastor, thank the Lord. Um, so this is a great guy. Verse 5, then Boaz asks his foreman, who's that woman over there? Who does she belong to? I mean, so he notices her. Um, and he starts to ask about her. And the romance begins. Verse 6, and the foreman replied, she's the young woman from Moab who came back with Naomi. She asked me this morning if she could gather grain behind the harvesters. She has been hard at work ever since, except for a few minutes rest in the shelter. So the, this, this foreman says she's a Moabite. That's the wrong people, right? Because he's, he's from Israel. He's a Jewish man. They came from incest. Her people worship this demon god, Chemeth. So she came from worshiping a false god, a, a demon god. They sacrificed their kids to this demon. She was a widow, so she'd been married before. It wasn't, uh, you know, she was now homeless. She's poor. She's with Naomi, called, who's telling everybody, call me Mara, call me bitter. My life is so bad. And she's, so she's with that bitter old woman. Um, she had some baggage. Naomi had some baggage from their past, to say the least. But she didn't let her past define her she used her past to prepare her for her future and this is the new chapter and thank god he still wants to use us even when we have a bad past right because none of us have a perfect past right i don't know about you but i've made a lot of mistakes in my life so this foreman tells boaz all of these things about her yeah she's bad she's a moabite that should have been a huge red flag but boaz saw some things that changed his mind verse 8 Boaz went over and said to Ruth, Listen, my daughter, stay right here with us when you gather grain. Don't go to any other fields. Stay right behind the young women working in my field. See which part of the field they're harvesting and then follow them. I have warned the young men not to treat you roughly. And when you are thirsty, help yourself to the water they have drawn from the well. Ruth fell at his feet and thanked him warmly. What have I done to deserve such kindness, she asked. I'm only a foreigner. Yes, I know, Boaz replied, but I also know about everything you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I've heard how you left your father and mother and how you uh, uh, and your land to live here among complete strangers. 
May the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. I hope I continue to please you, sir, she replied. You have comforted me by speaking so kindly to me, even though I am not one of your workers. Even with hearing the bad things about Ruth, Boaz saw something special in her. He saw she left her past and her false gods to, to follow the one true God. He saw she was faithful and loyal to her family, Naomi. He saw she was a hard worker out in the fields and was providing for herself and for Naomi. He saw that she was honoring God with her morals because in that time period, when a woman in one of these pagan cities uh, became a widow, she would have to oftentimes revert to prostitution just to provide for her family. So he saw that she wasn't doing that. She kept her morals. Ruth straight stayed true to the commitment that she made to God and the commitment that she had made to Naomi. So Boaz saw some really good things qualities in this woman so boaz is interested he provides for her he protects her he even prays for her in verse 12 he's praying for her. ruth saw that from boaz as well so she begins to see things in him she saw his protection and his provision she saw him pray for her i mean those are qualities that ladies should be looking for in a man not a guy who just provides and takes care of her but a, a somebody who prays for her this was a guy who was a good man it's not like Ruth couldn't do those things for herself. I mean, she's out there in the field providing for herself, right? She's a strong, powerful, independent woman. She didn't have to have him. But the right man always wants to do those kind of things for the woman in his life. And so the romance continues. Verse 14. At mealtime, Boaz called to her, Come over here and help yourself to some food. You can dip your bread in the sour wine. So she sat with the harvesters, and Boaz gave her some roasted grain to eat. She ate all she wanted and still had some left over. Boaz was providing for her. There was more than she could eat. She went from the field picking up the scraps that were left over to sitting at the man's table eating with the boss. You know, I grew up in Kentucky, and we, had, we grew up a lot of corn there. And so I, I, and I loved to hunt. So I would be out watching the fields for when the, the, the big combine would come through and harvest the corn. And I would watch for where the combine lost stuff and pick those ears of corn up and put them in a pile for the deer so the deer had something to eat. And I always made sure it was close enough for me to be able to get one if I wanted one. So I would walk through and I would watch where that, and that's what she's doing. She's walking through the field, finding what the harvesters missed, what the combine, so to speak, missed. And so she went from that, picking up the scraps, to sitting at the man's table. He was providing for her. He was taking care of her. It reminds me of Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 that says, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. God was giving Ruth more than she could ever ask or she could ever even think. There's so much more in the story we could look at. We're going to look at it over the next few weeks, but I kind of wanted to set this up today and talk about this, not just as a relationship that is budding and looking at, you know, the right kind of, we, we could have looked at the right kind of man to be, or the right kind of woman to be, or the right kind of marriage to have, or any of those things. But really, the thing that jumped out at me the most is that we're a lot like Ruth, you and I. Ruth was a Moabite. She was born into a sinful culture. We were born into a sinful culture, weren't we? All of us were born into a sinful culture. We're like the Moabites. We're sinners. Ruth came empty-handed. She had nothing to offer Boaz. We, so do we. We come to God with nothing. We have nothing that we can offer him that interests him except who we are. Everything good that Ruth had came from Boaz. Everything good that we have comes from God. Boaz blessed Ruth. God blesses us. He's given us more than we could ever expect. He gives us more than we could ever deserve. And he's given us a new life that we can have in him, just like Boaz is about to give Ruth a new life that she could have never imagined. Boaz invites Ruth to his table. Jesus invites us to his table. He provides every need for her. God and Jesus, they provide every need for that we could ever have. There's always more than enough for us, and there's always more there for us. There's always leftovers. In chapter 1, things looked bad, but in chapter 2, everything changed. We've got to leave Moab to find the blessings that are in Bethlehem. Ruth 
It's a lot like us. And we needed that Savior. And that's what Boaz is going to be called later as a Savior for Ruth. We needed that Savior as well who came in and changed everything for us. Took us from the field, picking up scraps, and provided a new life for us. When you hear that and when you read that in this story, what comes to your mind? What do you think of? Tim's not here, so somebody else is going to have to talk today. <coughs> is Ruby, you're picking up the mantle for Dad? <laughs> what jumps out to you in the story? You know, there's a lot of things in life that you do and make decisions or whatever down the road and even though we don't know the outcome of it all at that moment and uh, even things in our lives before we became a Christian, you know, there was a woman across the street praying for Judy and I. Mm -hmm. I didn't know until later that, uh, that we Eventually, I got saved, and Judy got saved, and Pam got saved. But before that, I would have never known all this thing would happen in our lives. Yeah. So, like, uh, when Naomi went back with her daughter-in-law, they didn't know what all the outcome was going to be either. Mm -hmm. But praying is probably the main, main thing. Yeah in our lives. Absolutely. That's very good, Tony. Very good. Anybody else some jump out at you? Well, Boaz, he was, uh, he seen the qualities in Ruth. Uh, she's a hard worker and uh, you know she had a, a good spirit about her and uh, she was you know easy going and so he's seen those qualities and and then she's seen his uh, strength and leadership too and uh, you know it was all a plan of God uh, too for their lives you know because she was part of the ancestry of Jesus, right. and so God had Boaz set aside for. And you know, there used to be a uh, Christian song about uh, I don't I don't know how it went, but this guy would sing about uh, you know a kid that God already had somebody for this little kid, you know. And so I think if parents will think of that and pray for their little children to meet that you know we do that for our grandsons now you know that they yeah. will meet somebody that's a good Christian girl and uh, <clears throat> grow up and marry that Christian girl and God has somebody out there already for them you know and just them finding them you know yeah and another thing that uh, whenever you mention the Moab mm -hmm. uh, this kind of gets away from the story but how the people were wicked in the land of Moab if you guys ever go to Moab Utah and you go to the arches as a believer when you ride through that park of the arches it's a bunch of uh, formed uh, rocks and so as a believer you s it's like you know that we know of course they say it's billions of years old but uh, we know that it was formed by the flood. And you see these images in the rocks, you know, that just like, man, were those images, God, that you just cast into the rocks, you know? I mean, it looks like you see a hand poking up out of the, into a great big rock that's 200 feet high or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and faces, you know, and it's just like, and then it makes you think of the Moabites as a believer and how wicked they were. And it's just, you know, that was just my experience. You yeah. Know? And so if you ever go there, pay attention. I've never been there. Yeah. 
it, it, it's different, you know. And, and so as a believer, you get that in your head to look past and you see things like that, you know. So, and it reminded me of the story of the Moabites, you know. So, yeah. So. Looking past and looking into things. It's that same thing that, you know, none of this says that Boaz was a handsome guy or that Ruth was a knockout. I mean, Boaz was a, a, obviously an adult man. It doesn't say that he was married to somebody else. He was, it gives us every indication he's a single man. So why was a single guy that old, that successful, not married? You know, God was keeping him for Ruth. And uh, it doesn't say anything about a physical attraction. I'm sure there was. But otherwise, why would Boaz have been uh, pointing out to that, hey, who's that girl, <laughs> you know? kind of a thing but you know there's got to be more than just looks and attraction in a relationship and that's what these two saw was something deeper you know I grew up here and you know beauty's only skin deep but ugly goes all the way to the bone <laughs> uh, you know <laughs> yeah. oh yeah there has to be that <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but there's got to be more than just that <laughs> you know that's good. That's good. <laughs> Anybody else? If uh, God said, you know, don't mess with any of the people in Moab, don't go there or anything, why would Boaz even have thought to, to mess with her at all? Because that would be, per se, going against what God said. Yeah. I thought about that many times myself. And it doesn't tell us. It just says that because she had made the decision, it, the my opinion is because she had made that decision that we read about where she said your god will be my god she wasn't she was turning her back on her past and coming over into she may not have been um a israelite or a jew by birth but she was by choice so it's like she made the choice to come out of that i am not this anymore i am following the one true god and i believe that's why but i, I thought the same thing too i've read this story many times and i'm like man he married the girl from the wrong side of the tracks. What's the lesson there? <laughs> lesson was she left it all behind and was going after God. And God prepared her and Boaz and then put him in the line of Christ. So God can take our mess and still use us. As bad as we can be and as bad as our genealogy can be, our family can be, our life can be, no matter how big of a mess we've made, God can still use us if we'll turn to him. Because that's, that's us. We're Ruth in the story. We, we've messed up. and We needed Boaz. We need Jesus to redeem us. Very good. We're adopted into God's family too as Gentiles. Just like Ruth was adopted into that family. Absolutely. 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 Very good. And do uh, you think this story shows how uh, like you can remarry after spouse dies because some people say like there's nothing really exclusively in the bible that says you're allowed to remarry even if your spouse dies yeah i believe you can um, i believe there's also grounds you know we've talked about divorce in the past and things like that i believe there's grounds for that as well um yeah i'm not one of the ones that says you know once you've married one person that's the only person you can be married to till you die we see over and over i mean even the when uh the uh, uh, scribes came to Jesus and said, you know, the one guy died and his brother had her and he went seven deep. <laughs> and they didn't have any kids. So that, that lady was married to seven guys and killed all seven of them somehow. <laughs> Watch out who you marry, guys. <laughs> it could be the death of you. <laughs> yeah, I believe that, Ruby. That's a good question, though. It's a great question. Well, let's pray, and we'll uh, get out of here a little early today. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for caring and loving us, even when we were unlovable. You, you took the time, and, and you invested in us, and you still do. You've given us more than we could ever ask or think, and we, there's more there for us at every turn. Thank you for loving us and caring for us unconditionally, and help us do the same for others to show your love so that we can make a difference in somebody else's life. Be with us this weekend. Help us to enjoy the rest of it and our time together today as we finish up. And Lord, even, even having an extra day off tomorrow, 
helps us to be able to uh, take a little time and think about the story today and how we fit into the story. Keep those that are away from us today safe as they're traveling, and many are. Pray that you would take care of them, bring them back safely to us. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.